Today's the day everyone has been amped up for here at the Heroes Global Championship. We started with the rivalry between Dignitas and Fnatic, and now we get the NA rivalry between Tempo Storm and Gale Force Esports. I'm Gillybeard, as always, here with Dreadnought and Dread. That match between Fnatic and Dignitas was explosive. Yeah, it was. It was really, it's always awesome to be able to see the powerhouses of Europe be able to go head to head. And huge congratulations to Fnatic by being able to qualify for the Western Clash. Now moving on to North America, let's check in with the standings yet again and see why all of these matches from here on out are incredibly important. Tempo Storm and Team 8 both have qualified for the Western Clash already, and only Team Neventic and No Tomorrow so far are ones who are unable to claim that final spot, which means we have four teams still in North America trying to battle it out for that last spot. Now, it should be noted that Gale Force Esports do not have to beat Tempo Storm to still be in the running for that spot, but man, if they could beat Tempo Storm today, it makes things a lot scarier for those other teams. Yeah, it very much does. If if Gale Force is able to be able to take out Tempo Storm here today, it would make it to where all those other the other three teams that have the opportunity pretty much need a miracle run, uh, really. Not even just in their own games, like how the other teams have to lose. Yeah. They, they almost don't have control of their own fate at that point. So if Gale Force is able to do it, it changes everything for the North American scene. Now, looking in at today's schedule, we started off with HGC Korea, and after that, HGC Europe. That's where we saw the rivalry between Dignitas and Fnatic. And guys, I can't stress enough, if you missed this match, make sure you go to our website, watch the VODs, because it's everything you could have dreamed of in a match between these two teams. Then the Battle of Rexars and how to play them took place between Synergy and Playing Ducks. Playing Ducks proving they were the true Misha masters, taking that series 3-1. We're going to close things out, seeing if Team Freedom can keep their Western Clash hopes alive versus no tomorrow. But we kick things off when the rematch of the Grand Finals from the NA Fall Regionals between Tempo Storm and Gale Force Esports. It's going to be an amazing match. I'm very excited to see, you know, when it comes to the draft, the strategy between these two teams play style wise is going to be relatively similar to one another. Uh, you know, we always talk about the fall sad split soaking play style. Yeah. Both of them run that. So it's going to be awesome to see that finally be able to clash here. And we have so much we want to say about this match, but they have a lot they want to say about each other too. So let's hear from Gale Force Esports and Tempo Storm what they're expecting in this matchup. A ton in the past, we scrim against them a lot. Both of us are very familiar with how each other plays. Both of us practice against each other and like figure out our own independent play styles. Pretty much anything can happen depending on what people decide to draft and like what ends up getting target banned week to week with how Psalm likes playing his. One hero of the month. They've been pretty dominant so far in NA. They've won the last two regionals. Went to Worlds. On paper, they're the strongest team, but I think that we can definitely beat them. I think June is definitely the strongest player on their team. He's just a really consistent support, and it's a pretty good hero pool. Doesn't really make any mistakes. They put in a lot of time and work into, you know, scrimming and trying to show results. I think last year they had a lot of issues like changing their rosters and stuff like that. And I think this year, they, you know, they have a solid roster. They have a lot of good players. Now Equinox on tank, we'll see how he can do. But so far we've been screaming them the most and I think they will definitely be our strongest rival. Fury is an amazing player. I have a lot of respect for Fury just as a person. Um, the way he whole handled the whole situation of leaving or being forced to leave, asked to leave Gale Force essentially. He, um, in hindsight, I think it was the wrong decision on our part, on my part mainly, because I was the captain at the time and I was, um, ultimately it kind of came down to me, it was my decision, and I think we really messed up. Fury has handled the situation, has been amazing. He's still, um, I remember the first land after we kicked him, he came up to me and gave me a hug and he said no hard feelings. And that is so rare and so impressive. Um, especially in this scene, there's a lot of, um, whenever people leave teams, there's a lot of like, animosity, a lot of bad blood. Um, which it makes me happy that Fury reacted that way because I really did value him as a friend and I still value him as a friend. And I mean, he is undoubtedly the best tank in NA. So um, I'm really happy for you for him. I'm happy that he had a good home in Tempo Storm. Of course, I'm gonna beat him, so it's gonna be cool. <laughs> Started as a revenge match for Fury has morphed into a rivalry match between friends. We are so excited for this match specifically. We want to start by talking about uh, Fan versus Psalm specifically as players for the teams because Fan has been known for so long as a playmaker and Psalm, we've been talking about him all weekend and how much he has stepped up during his time with the rest of the players of Tempo Storm. 
These guys' Zeratul's are ridiculous. Psalm has not been beaten on Zeratul. He's eight out of eight now. Fan, similarly, three out of three. He hasn't even died on Zeratul yet in those three games. So both of these players just showcasing incredible abilities between the two of them. I can't wait to see how these two match up. Who gets to play Zeratul? Who, what, whatever anyone else is going to have to play, these two are gonna be big ones to watch in this series. And then we move on and we have to talk about June and Akaface's well dread. Yeah, those players, uh, the supports for both their respective teams are very impressive players. Uh, and we're gonna take a look at them right now. And the main reason is purely just, I mean, June has the highest KDA out of any player in all of HTC North America yes. so far. Uh, Akaface and June, you know, they're the supports, but they are huge playmakers for their teams. And I think more than anything, the one thing I would like to highlight here is just that North America for a while was very criticized on the lack of supports that we had, uh, you know, to kind of be able to compete at the very much top level. And it feels like June, Akaface, and now it feels like Buds is kind of rising towards that, filling that role after having his Ross, or role swap, excuse me. But these guys are... Huge. Like, we've seen Akaface just make those colossal plays. You even saw Akaface give the, pay his respects, if you will, uh, to June in that interview because they both realize what they contribute, like, to the team and to the group. And I feel like, I very confidently, neither of these teams would be where they are without those two players. Well, between these two teams, a lot comes down to the battlegrounds. They have a lot of the same battlegrounds that they prefer. So let's check out the battleground pool for HCC and see where the first game will be taking place. Gale Force Esports has banned Tomb of the Spider Queen and, and Infernal Shrines was the ban for Tempo Storm. So not banning Battlefield of Eternity like we've seen in the past for Tempo. Gale Force Esports is a home team, so they'll be the first team to choose a map, and they've chosen Braxis Holdout. Braxis Holdout is going to be very comfortable map for both of these teams. It's definitely not a, you know, let us try and catch the opponents off guard. It's just, we're gonna play our game, and we're gonna see how it plays out against their opponents there. So I like the fact that we're gonna be moving into the Braxis. Uh, the Morales can, you know, Contest is obviously going to be a heavy focus for both these teams. Other than that, though, I don't know if we might see a Jewel Jin on the we side might. of Gale Force. Uh, that's something that can always, you know, pop up here on Braxis. Other than that, though, I think the drafts will be pretty close to what they've been running, you know, in the past couple of weeks. So these two teams, they talked about how much they've been scrimming versus each other. Um, obviously, they probably haven't been in the last week or so, knowing that they need to start preparing some strategies for each other. So how likely is it, do you think, that they will bring anything and crazy to try to throw one each other off? I think it's pretty, uh, Gale Force specifically, I think is going to be more likely to be able to bust out. And I think it's pretty common that it will happen here in the series. Because again, it means so much for them, their ability to be able to qualify for the clashes. And then also just, it's a bigger fight for Gale Force than it is Tempo. Tempo is just, you know, proceed to not keep not losing, really. Uh, whereas Gale Force Esports, like, it just means so much more for them. So I do expect that if any has a creative strategy, it's going to be GFE that pulls it out. We're still waiting on a few of the players to be ready for our first draft, but I want to go back to the video because you and I, when we first saw that preview video and while we were getting ready during the European broadcast, we were blown away by what Michael Udall specifically said about Fan yeah. and how willing he was to admit that it was a, maybe a mistake to let uh, Fury go off yeah. of the team. And that was a huge turning point for Fury. Um, he had a, questioned a lot about what he was going to do, but put together this team that ended up beating Gale Force Esports the next tournament they went up to, but Fury showing so much maturity and saying, like, I understand, I've made a team now. But, man, that was crazy to hear from Michael. Yeah, it was very surprising to hear that from him. And I think it's a sign not only on the side of Fury, right, the compliments that you'd always be able to give out, but as a leader, uh, not only to be able to admit, you know, it, more than anything, not only claim the mistake himself, but to admit that it's a mistake as a leader of a team, I think is one of the most mature things I feel like I've seen out of any representative out of the North American scene so far. So props to both sides, really, when it comes to that. It's amazing, you know, the comfortability it seems like you'd all had in that scenario uh, to just, you know, be like, you know, I messed up and he's okay with that. And, you know, just co continuing to look forward and better themselves as a team. It's awesome to see that from a leader. Yeah, it seems like Mike is in general really um, willing to do that when he talked about B Kid and how it, it did hurt him when B Kid chose to leave and go to Neventic. But now that they have Equinox, they're trying this for flex and a support, still figuring out really where they fit within this North American scene, where they're able to make uh, their metas happen. and. That has been a talking point for us before, specifically their Warriors and who ends up playing that Warrior. And we'll see how that adaptation comes in this weekend because we haven't yet seen Gale Force Esports play this weekend. Yeah, it is it is going to be interesting here because, yeah, as you said, you know, the Warrior position has been uh, one that has been filled for Gale Force, but it, the who is the person playing the Warrior, in fact, is always changing. And 
it's been, in my opinion, the easiest weakness to identify out of Gale Force is just being able to punish that warrior. So we'll see if Tempo Storm can do that here. Bands, though, going to be Malfurion and Zarya. Zarya is so prominent of a band there on Braxis Holdout. That means we do see Tassadar let through on the draft, something we almost, I don't think we've even seen yet after this current patch this week. One time. That is true. There yeah, was we a Tassadar game. We got one Tassadar game. I think it was yesterday, may have been the day before. But Tempo Storm's not falling for the bait. Instead, getting Vala first, making sure that they have this hero that both teams have shown to play a lot, but especially Tempo Storm having, uh, making sure that they have Vala here for the area damage in the Zerg Rush. Tass and Morales are going to be the pickup here that leads heavy towards a Zul'jin pick later into the draft. We'll see if Tempo Storm is going to be banning that or if they have no concern, but now in their rotation, no Malfurion. So do we see them put focus here uh, onto the rest of the draft into, you know, more of the Varian? Or is it going to be, you know, keeping it simple with Temple Storm's playstyle, what they've been able to do um, is not so focused into the Varian, uh, but I can see them making that adjustment. It's funny because we saw Tempo Storm bust out solo warrior Varian at the Gold Club World Championship just, I think, one time and then never since. But after uh, Team 8 looked so dominant with Varian versus Tempo Storm, Tempo actually, a Fury tweeted and said, thanks for proving to my team that Varian's a really strong pick. Maybe now I'll get to play him because I know, I know he really does enjoy playing Varian and it looks like Justin was able to convince Fury uh, and the rest of Tempo Storm that it's a good pickup to have. So Varian is going to be the choice, but an Ariel here for Temple Storm now with the, you know, the ban, ban onto Malfurion is just, Ariel is not a rare pick, but before the secondary ban phase, now we might see Gale Force um, transition towards something to heavily be able to punish the lack of cleanse that exists with Ariel. Uh, obviously, we've seen Mind Control Savannah. There's the Chromies that have popped up here and there uh, across the world. So maybe they'll make that adjustment. But again, it's a, it's a less common in the North American scene than it is in other parts of the world. Do you think that this is going to be Tempo Storm going back to that double support? But instead of having Brightwing and Malfurion playing it more to the style that it was originally, which was Ariel and then Brightwing, and then Vala is just a beast. She just does whatever she wants. I, they may move that direction. Yeah, that's a good, you know, I, I think it does lean the draft decisions made on the side of Temple Storm, possibly, uh, because wasn't that into the Zul'jin as well in that game? I believe it was when they ran that double support. I got to look this up because ET, it was Brightwing and Malfurion and it was into a Morales Zul'jin. Ah. So it's again going to be kind of that same matchup. It very much could be uh, that coming out for Temple Storm. It did not look good last time we no. saw it, though. It, a very, very little effect onto the map it really did it have at uh, any point. And that is just going to be banned outright now, leaving Gul'dan up here for Gale Force. It's something that we typically see with uh, the Morales itself on Braxis Holdout. Yeah, that would be Michael Udall who plays that. Not necessarily the case here, especially with Tassadar. That's another one of Mike's heroes. They've been playing just however they feel most comfortable with that, but they do need some sort of um, four-man damage dealer. They still need the warrior, and then whomever is going to be in the top lane. Yeah, I feel like the top lane is probably going to be a Ragnaros, most likely, from GFE. The fact that it has made it this deep. Uh, Ragnaros, you know, Gul'dan rotation uh, could be very powerful for them right now. Uh, that's what I guess I feel is going to be the case. They don't have to pick in the Ragnaros. Uh, it complements the map so well, though, and such a good solo laner um, that I don't expect them letting that pick up specifically. It's just if they want to move into the Gul'dan or they feel they have another, you know, empowered between Morales and Tassadar there in the four-man, a different DPS. But it does seem like, you know, Ghoul would probably be the most effective. They, being Gale Force Esports, haven't played Ragnaros on this map yet. They've liked Artanis a lot more in the solo lane and then one time playing Thrall. ETC Gul'dan, so they are still waiting on that final pick for the solo laner, but ETC will be the warrior played by Gale Force Esports. Making me think more and more that that's going to be Kron playing that, just because it is ETC, uh, but Gul'dan definitely to help with uh, that four man down in the bottom. Yeah, Gale Force Esports here have, obviously they have a really amazing amount of skirmish potential and just wave clear into the bottom half. Temple Storm now, when it comes to their four man, uh, should be looking for some kill potential. We'll see if they go in the direction of the double support that you were talking about. Uh, because it it's not into the Zul'jin, though, so probably not. I guess I don't... To be honest, I don't know the parameters they to bust out double support. Before Zul'jin was even a thought in teams' minds, though. Okay, well it then... Was way, it was like a PAX that they would run it on Braxis. Yeah, it's... it's. I don't know. We'll see if they move there. Uh, other than that, I would really like to see, you know, in the top lane, either the Ragnaros or the Dahaka. They go with the Artanis for the skirmish potential. Right. And then, in fact, it is going to be Tychus now joining 
uh, in the four man down below. So what is the response for Gale Force? Do they think Ragnaros does well into the Artanis or do they see, you know, a different solo um, fitting their interest the best here? Could be a Rexar. Could be. We saw a lot of Rexar play in Europe Leoric over today. Wouldn't be Oh man, Leoric wouldn't be terrible in this scenario. I don't think it does well necessarily into the matchup, but this is one of the few maps where we do see Leoric into uh, the solo top, just mainly with the Gul'dan and Tassadar, that survivability, long uh, sustained team fights is something we've seen out of the European region uh, historically on other maps, so might be something they're considering, but overall, I feel like it's gonna be the Ragnaros. I do too. I like how he can clear the waves pretty fast um, versus Artanis and pushing Artanis even back into his lane. That guarantees Gale Force Esports gets um, if they can do that top lane, and then they already have Morales to keep continually healing in bottom lane with Tassadar too. That could even be a, a good spot for Gilforce just to full nice. on grab both. But Dahaka is a great choice too. Dahaka is a hero that I, I we I've talked about it time and time again. I think he's one of the best top uh, solo laners in the entire game, and I like to see more of him in the North American scene. That being said, with Ragnaros up, I don't know if I think that was a more optimal pick here. We'll see if you know Gilforce can build the argument there. Uh, just because Ragnaros complements the map objective, whereas the Haka doesn't, but the global kind of does in the sense that the shrines, you know, that split pressure that it can provide there. But I was a little surprised to see the Artanis still coming out of Temple Storm when it comes to the solo lane um, mm -hmm. there up in the top, showing a heavy prominence. It's been more dominant here in North America, at least when it comes to priority, than it has in other parts of the world. So Gale Force Esports are running a double support, double warrior composition with Gul'dan as the primary damage dealer. Do you think that is enough damage as with now Tassadar, his rework, how's that going to work out for them? I think it will be enough. It won't be bursty by any means. It will be long and drawn out team fights. So as long as nobody uh, gets picked out and they allow the Gul'dan to be able to do what he does, Tassadar with the shielding and the poke overall, it will eventually be able to wear down with Morales in the survivability. It's just not getting bursted or flanked on the side of Temple Storm is the main focus and Varian's so, so good at that. We've had a lot of talks about what build Tassadar should be going on Brax's holdout. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, good ideas for being able to take Psy Infusion at one because there are so many unique targets that you can hit with your Psy Storms if you want to add to damage there. But there are always free globes you could get too. So what are you thinking is going to happen? I honestly think, at least for now, it seems like the teams have identified the idea of getting, you know, the sustained shields mixed with the 25% or 25 armor is better than any other option, right? We've seen as a general rule that is going to be the case. But yeah, I do like, uh, I do think there's an opportunity to move into uh, the stacking town, getting it onto the Zerg Rush very early on, moving into a double W at 16. That will complement more DPS, you know, less survivability. And that really could make up for, you know, that solo Gul'dan uh, into this game. And I think... I don't think we'll see it, but I, I think it is a reasonable direction for GFU to go. Well, guys, we are ready for game number one between Tempo Storm, Gale Force Esports. Tell your friends, get on Twitter, use the hashtag HGC, because we're heading into Braxis Holdout. Braxis Holdout? It's here we go. Now we've got it. Braxis Holdout here on the blue side is going to be Gale Force Esports. On the Morales is going to be Aquaface Equinox playing the Dahaka there in the solo. Mike Udall will be on the Gul'dan, joining the four-man ETC, going to be played by Crowen. And last is going to be Fan there on the Tassadar. Ooh, Fantassadar, it's been a while. It, Fantassadar, fantastic. Fantastic, Dar. Okay, over in Tempo Storm, I missed one, but Fury is going to be playing Varian. They're going to be in the red. Cawthon Luck will be on Vala. Som will be playing Artanis. Playing Tychus will be Caterpillar. And the one I missed must have been June playing Ariel. And we do not see Tassadar actually picking a level one yet, so there is still hope for moving into the W Talion. Ooh, what is that? Q build going out on Gul'dan already here at level one. No Echo Corruption. Pursuit of Flame. Huh. They're going to start out here four-man rotation for Temple Storm. Crowen's going to get a pretty big power slide. There's going to be the damage coming out. Fury with the charge there. Uh, but there again, there is no major burst damage on the side of Gale Force Esports. So uh, they can't easily punish things like that. And it's not going to change. There are no talent choices they can take uh, to really change and in increase their burst potential here uh, with their draft. And we do see and it is going to be the Globe talent there at level 1 for Fan. So sticking with the traditional Tassadar that we've at least seen so far around the world. All right, let's talk about Pursuit of Flame. We don't see it very often, but he's trying to hit 40 enemy heroes with Fell Flame, and then the radius will be increased by 10%. Later on, you can get Rampant Hellfire at 16, and that every time you hit a hero increases the damage of the next Fell Flame too. So just building into Fell Flame 
over what we see so much, which is echoed corruption, especially on this battleground. Oh. Volant gets taken out, but on this battleground specifically because uh, it is so easy when you're in a four-man with Gul'dan to make sure you're getting those stacks. But in this case, maybe just full on, like we're gonna clear out the waves so fast and just be a dominant force right out of the gates in the early game. The one thing that this build does have going for it compared to moving into the Echo Corruption, obviously not having to sack is a pretty cool dynamic, uh, but beyond all else, it's it's got higher damage output potential, uh, but at riskier positioning. The thankful part of this for uh, Mike Udall there uh, is gonna be that he has a Tassadar and having the morale to be able to keep him up is the plan. Being, you know, it's, it's kind of like the double, double support Vala argument. It's it's literally just putting it to where I have a better damage output if I can just be very risky. Tracer, Tass, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Gul'dan has that with the Q build over his E build. Uh, the problem with it is, though, is just most of the time you aren't comfortable moving at that range, at that close of range, to truly gain value out of the build. And maybe we'll see Demonic Circle at 20 just to make sure that he can stay safe. We'll continue to keep an eye on this build as well as his stacks, which are already about halfway done. He has grabbed Consume Soul, so even with having Morales, Still wanting to have a little bit extra self-sustain, his ability to keep the waves pushed and be able to heal himself back up. We haven't even talked yet about the laning and the way that Gale Force Esports went straight up to top with their four man and have already started working on bringing down that force. Yeah, Temple Storm's actually playing this perfectly. They realize they have a weaker four man than Gale Force. I mean, it's a ghoul damn morale. So you just flat out don't beat that unless you have kill potential, which they admit they really don't have only with Varian and that Warbringer. So what Temple's doing is trying to dictate the rotations of Gale Force. Gale Force match them. Yes, they push on top, but Tempo matches them on bottom. If they were truly going blow for blow, four versus four, one versus one, get Temple Storm's draft would struggle. So the fact that they're getting an even trade here is really beautiful rotation and decision making coming out from them so far. So Fort for Fort traded both teams very close in experience, even with the one Vala kill early on that Gale Force Esports got. They're just going to keep a hold of their respective beacons. Temple Storm watching for all the members of Gale Force Esports to move down, sending some people up to make the swap again. So Sam is going to buy as much time as he can, dives forward, might be in trouble because there's a power slide available for Crowen, and now that puts Crowen in a great spot to body block. And Sam will get brought down another kill for Gale Force. Yeah, good need there from Aquaface, and the rest of Gale Force is going to be able to confirm the kill here, sitting 2-0 to zero in favor of GFE. Uh, Dahaka there questioning whether or not he has the ability uh, to capture the shrine. He's going to be transitioning. You know, good old swap here. Uh, we do see Fan is going to stick with bottom. We do also see a couple of changes when it comes to talents. At level 4, it's going to be Bio Shield coming out from Akaface there. Uh, what that means is that when the target is going to be full health, it absorbs damage. It gives them a shield. The reason why... Hold on a minute. Small skirmish. Drag attempt. And it's going to be about the end of that one. The reason why you typically don't see this is because that means you cannot change your beam target. It gains zero value unless they're at full HP, and then you're keeping it on the same target. The minute you swap, the shield drops, which then only alludes more to the fact that we see Q build Gul'dan. This is going to be, you know, uh, the enabler strategy, but rarely we do we see it on a caster. Ooh, hunger for power. Increasing ability power by 15%, but reduces healing received from allies by 25%. But if they have this bio shield now, if they have shielding, of course, from uh, Tassadar as well as the armor, now that he has Kala's Light too, looking at just being able to keep shielding up, and Michael Udall can be the full carry cool Dan. Yeah, it, the, again, the damage output here of this build is insane. Uh, it's just all about the survivability and if the tools are going to be available on the side of Tempest Storm to be able to get that pick. Aka Face is going to be all over Mike Udall this matchup, and you can expect Fury is going to keep his eyes on either one of them. Uh, purely just on the damage output and survivability. Bit of a skirmish here up on the top shrine. Udall trying to be able to clear it there with his Q for now. Seven still for both teams, so it's even in talent tiers. There's oh, power side in. Detainment strike, great from June to save Fury. He's gonna walk through, dodges the corruption. And Fury will stay safe. It seems so interesting to me that versus an Artanis, especially Gale Force Esports are still willing to go for this risky style of play with Morales, but especially with Gul'dan. I, it, it just, how do I, uh, so, okay, so if you change out those heroes with somebody that's, you know, more likely, or less likely, I guess, get, to get swapped or be able to survive if they end up getting swapped, the comp would struggle a bit more. I guess I just view it as, Artanis, there is no pick you can pick to be like, well, what if we get, what if we get swapped? It's like, well, if you got swapped, it's going to suck. No matter what hero you picked. What about so, Vala? Who has Vala? Anybody I else? Mean, there are a couple exceptions. Like, you know, Tassadar is going to be able to E right on out of there. And there are, like, it's kind of the anti-stitches. Back in the day, it'd be like, well, they have a stitches. Pick as many anti-killable heroes yeah. in the game. But I do think that we've evolved, uh, you know, to a complex level enough 
Heroes of the Storm where it gets to the point where you can't just build a comp around surviving a swap. It very much has to be, well, just don't get swapped here. Um, and so I do like it, but it is, it, you're right, it is a very risky choice. Yeah, especially the build specifically. Yes. But. For now, Gale Force Esports are ahead of this game, still just slightly in beacon progress, 38 to 12, trying to get heroic abilities and continually running back and forth in the lanes with their four man, showing some very diligent and well thought out switches between the lanes, especially with their Dahaka and the fact that he can brush stock in. So just keeping Tempo Storm on the back seat and trying to make sure that they're the ones who get to 10 faster. There's going to be Fury going in for the damage there. On to Crow and Power Slide response. That's going to be Udal throwing out a bit of damage over the wall. He's in a tough spot. No heal beam on him yet. Putting so much damage, though, onto Cattle. Equinox is diving deep. He's got the double. The symbiosis. Mikey Doll confirms one kill. Cawthon gets the dash out. No drag available. And that is going to be another pick going over to GFE as they now close in on 10. Now that 10's here, someone can rotate down to the bottom. We'll see what heroic abilities want to be the choice for Gale Force Esports. Adaptation has been generally the favored for Dahaka, although there was uh, an isolation earlier today, and I think we've had one in North America thus far. But more importantly for Gale Force Esports, they're also building into the beacons finally and should be able to get a nice, healthy 100% Zerg rush to just the 12% for Tempo Storm. It's only a few Zerglings for Tempo Storm in this push. Yeah, the, another subtle thing when looking at the Gul'dan build-in strategy that Gale Force Esports has put together. Uh, the other thing is it does technically have better Zerg rush clearing, but not so much that I would look at it and be like, that's why they, you know, that is not the argument for it here. It's very much that they have the ability for you all to have that risking, risky positioning. Either way, though, Gale Force Esports here with their Zerg Rush grouping up. They're going to be looking towards the top keep. Artanis and Dahaka are still residing onto the bottom half of the map, so Temple Storm here has a lot to clear up. Artanis has Purifier Beam. We'll see who he wants to use that on, but maybe even on Morales to force her into the medevac or into top else position. Away. Maybe, yeah, is two as well. So what it can do is when, because uh, essentially Udal has to be permanent beam. So, oh, there's going to be a swapped attempt. No detainment strike going to be able to hit. Horrify is going to be dropped here. Purify beam now onto Akaface. Udal is in a rough position. The taunt comes out. He is already going to be removed. Even with the detainment strike not hitting, beautiful swap onto Gul'dan, and the purifier beam pushes Akaface away. He had to run around. He got low in health. And that is how Tempo Storm are able to clear up the Zerg Rush as well as get back into this game. They weren't too far behind. They're doing their best to keep up with the rotations of Gale Force Esports, and it staunches any further push, any hope of taking out a keep from Gale Force. Yeah, and the B steps on top of it is only going to be a cherry here on top for Tempo Storm uh, coming out from Psalm. So, yeah, the aggressive positioning build that you're talking about, the swap potential of Artanis, uh, was very much the reason the Tempo Storm here has now been able to turn the tides, set it a little bit close to even, uh, closer to even into this game. But what I was going to say is, so you drop it on Morales, and Morales has to walk constantly to be able to get out of the distance of it. The problem is, is Udal wants to move forward, and if he moves forward, then now we're going to see Akafe's in a tough spot. But if he moves back, he's directly into the Purifier Beam. It's a struggle in both directions, so much so that I actually think that we should see a couple's therapy at 13 mm -hmm. to be able to make up for it. Now, he didn't get Trauma Trigger either, so there's not a lot of self-safety so far for Morales. But it does mean that you'd have to give up intensive care for Morales, so not as being able to heal up uh, from the de depths, the deficits, especially for Crowen specifically. But knowing that the beam is a lot of the times going to be on Mike, and especially with the shielding that he can build, as you can see on Crowen, plus Fan, yeah, I think couple th Couples Therapy are totally on the same page with you. Yeah, it just would make it so much easier for him to be able to make sure that Udall has the bio shielding uh, benefits there. I do love the change, though, for, you know, the thought process on the side of Temple Storm to see Artanis move into that not rid of the blind. Because, again, it's not going to gain much value, but then it also can just force Octoface to be that much more on point if this team wants to have success here. But for now, it's going to be even when it comes to the structures. The next Ryans are going to be spawning relatively soon, and both teams closing in towards that 13. Gale Force, small advantage when it comes to the experience, but it's not going to be enough to really, I think, have an impact in this game. We haven't talked yet about the build for Ariel either. It's, I believe, your favorite Ariel build. It is. It is my absolute favorite Ariel build here. Uh, mainly the 7, I adore it. I think if Ariel is going to be picked 90% of the time, you should move into the cooldown uh, there. But then even going with the mobility slow after the stun there, heavy burden at 4. And then the damage at one, it just allows you do a little damage, heal your entire team so frequently. Um, and then also you can be a big playmaker there with the detainment strike. That's going to be an early horrify, though, on the Psalm. Swap's not going to land. Is the drag going to hit? That is 
the, uh, excuse me, the heroic use for Artanis as well. Cattle started to move down to see if he could help. Now he has to run back to the safety of his fort, make sure that he can continue to get the soak in the lane despite losing Artanis. But this gives Gale Force Esports another time of power play. Moving on up, and it is Couples Therapy at level 13 that Morales has now being able to keep herself alive. Does make the uh, heal cost more mana, but still will be able to um, keep her alive at 25% of the regular heal. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough position to be in because then every one of the tick of damage that happens onto the shield itself will then eat um, is supporting in the mana resources available for Akafe, so he has to be very patient. Uh, post 20, it changes a little bit there, uh, but up until that point, very heavy consideration onto his uh, mana bar there, because again, you do once Bio Shield ticks up, if it's not full shielded, it will cost her mana to be able to heal him up, um, and that really can add up. You know, early on when Morales Absolutely. released, like any amount of damage, if you keep the beam only on one person, it's very easy to go oom. Um. Odin's gonna be dropped though in defense of the Zerg Rush. Was the swap attempt gets stalled out by Krohn, or was it a grenade even that stopped him? I don't, I think something was stopped. Either way, got the interrupt there, yeah. and the swap did not connect either. Uh, keep in mind, we do see the double swap there at 13, so will Song be able to land this one? Last time we saw them at a keep front wall, single handedly was able to turn the tide of the fight for his team. He does have Purifier Beam too, so immediately, as soon as the swap hits, can Purifier Beam to guarantee that Aquaface has to run in a weird direction. Maybe long enough, there's a double swap, but the gate wasn't down. He had only pulled Equinox and Crowen right up to the gate. So now with that five second cooldown reduction as well on the double swap, so we'll have another chance here in just a little bit. There he goes, moves in, swap on Fan. Fan's the one who was hit, but he has Dimensional Shift. He's gonna move right on out. Yeah, Tassadar maybe, you know, not the best target to be able to make that happen. Uh, on to Tassadar, still yet to be able to complete the level one. Gul'dan was very quick to be able to confirm uh, that's that can tell. Everything else, though, when it comes to questing here, uh, Tassadar's level 7 is still yet to be able to achieve uh, the CDR there with Mental Acuity at 7. So no craziness at level uh, 13 for Gul'dan. Still getting health stones so that he can keep himself healed back up. And now Temple Storm want to go for the fight before they get further behind. Swap hits Crowen, and he just goes right into a mosh pit. Crystal Aegis is used oh. to keep Psalm alive. Purifier Beam has been on Crowen this entire time. Maybe trying to burn him out while he was standing still, making him pay for his mosh pit, but that's not gonna matter. He is happy to continue that out as Tychus goes down. Yeah, and that even hurt worse, actually. Nade, they're gonna be the peel. Psalm is gonna end up falling here. No way he's gonna be able to make it out. 16 talents here, almost achieved for Gale Force Esports as they're gonna move into the keep. But what I wanted to know about that fight specifically with the new Tassadar build that we saw there, uh, the fact that the swap landed on the Chrome when he had the shield, even once getting past the shields, having that bonus armor, makes these swaps by Psalm that much more difficult to be able to hit the accurate target because even if you hit the squishy, that armor, the 25% damage reduction across the board is really hard to deal with. And that's why we see this consistent build out of Tassadar so far. Um, the level one being able to get that, you know, consistent onto a target because it still is going to be able to proc the level four and then seven and 13 together only increases the CDR shields on shields on shields and armor for everybody else. But we do see the double is psionic storm or psionic echo, excuse me, at 16. Maybe just in case, just in case they lose a Zerg Rush, they have a lot of ability to clear, just keep things cleared out by himself. Um, Shield Sequencer, again, for Morales seems to be generally the favorite, but it's going to make sure that nobody, really nobody this time from Gale Force Esports can get taken out. Between Morales and Tastar, these guys are untouchable. And Rampant Hellfire, the quest, or the talent I mentioned before, now coming into effect every time. Mike now hits a hero with Fell Flame. Its damage is increased by 8%, and that can stack up to five times. So he really can start shelling out damage with those. Yeah, it's just all about, does he have the positioning that's far enough forward to be able to gain value out of this uh, out of this build, excuse me, but far enough back to not be able to die. For now, obviously it's looking great here as GFE has their 16. They've got, you know, just slowly counting upward is going to be the Zerg Rush. Uh, Temple Storm very lost in what they're gonna be able to do into this game. They're scouting out the boss. Tassadar popping Oracle, not going to find any of Temple Storm yet. There's going to be Fury revealed. Invade onto the camp, but without 16, Temple Storm is going to reside on their side of the map. Now, we've seen this type of uh, hero collection composition for Tempo Storm before. They have Varian, they would love to be able to lock somebody down. But it feels like because they've gotten so far behind in this game, they are they resolve to just fight as soon as the Zerg Rush comes in and they can catch back up in the talent tiers. And at that point, things like this happen, where there's a swap, and then all of a sudden, the Crowen's in a great position just to drop a mosh pit. He's so well protected. Oh Som my goodness, Psalm. 
is in a tough spot. That might be enough to be game at this point. With three members dead, I don't think Temple Storm has the defensive tools to be able to pull away from this core rush. The Gale Force instantly moves up towards here, Gilly. This is going to be a game number one here. Very convincing fashion. Kills nine to two. Gale Force Esports. Game number one. Putting on a clinic here with Lieutenant Morales on Brax's holdout. Nine kills to two. They got well ahead in the game. They understood their composition, what they had to do with it, and it brought a little spice of surprise to Tempo Storm. It worked out very well for them. I, I loved it. At first, I was like, Q-Build? Like, what? Gul'dan? Like, uh, not saying that Q-Build doesn't have a spot, but I know the, the risk trade-off is one that uh, you have to be very confident in. But once I looked at the Morales and then I saw the tester, I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be a good game. Like, I see where this is going. And uh, it worked out very, very well for them. It's kind of the tale that we see of you know, uh, when you have Morales and Gul'dan, the wave clear, considering the four-man. That being said, though, Tempo Storm did by far, I think, the best out of any team we've seen in North America so far, understanding the strengths there and then making the adjustments. Much like we saw at a teammate, you know, constantly abusing the lack of wave clear. Tempo very clearly did that for the first couple of minutes, but one one bad team fight was all it took, and Gale Force completely snowballed. It's important for Tempo Storm, too. That was Gale Force Esports' battleground choice. They knew they got to pick the first map. They brought in the strategy, but it's far from over in this best of five. We're going to take a break. When we return, we'll have game number two between Tempo and Gale Force. you now. I'm all over it. See the full animated short at playoverwatch.com. Play free and experience the new StarCraft-themed Battlegrounds. Rated T for Teen. Mm, what do we have here? Let's get this promo tour started. 